A very good morning to you and you're welcome uh, to uh, the very first uh, signpost webinar uh, for 2022. You're most welcome to uh, today's session. Uh, we do hope you're keeping safe and well and uh, that you got to enjoy the Christmas break. Uh, I know it was an unusual one for many people, um, some people isolating and some people not getting to see friends and family. Uh, but uh, I suppose we're all hoping that 2022 will be uh, a, a little bit brighter for everybody. Uh, just to remind you uh, that this series is brought to you by Chagisk in collaboration with Dairy Sustainability Ireland and the National Rural Network and Food Drink Ireland Skillnet. And today we're going to be talking about ecosystem services uh, on the Caffrey, on Caffrey's farm up in Upland, Upland Farm. And Caffrey is the College of Agriculture, Food and Rural Enterprise in Northern Ireland. And I'm delighted to be joined by Brian uh, Irvine, who is Senior Biodiversity Technologist with CAFRI in Northern Ireland. And we also have Dr. Catherine Keena, uh, who's Countryside Management Specialist with uh, Chagas, who's going to be helping us out with the questions afterwards. Good morning to you both. Good morning. Good morning. So Brian, you're, you're joining us from the north. I believe you've got some snow up there this morning. Is that right? Yeah, the last three days on the, on the hill, we've, we've had the snow. Um, good to see. Uh, we've, we've missed a bit of hard weather the last few winters. Yeah, it's been an unusually yeah. mild winter, uh, particularly down here uh, where I'm living in the west of Ireland. Now we've, uh, well, we were expecting some snow last night. Uh, we haven't seen any any so far. I know a lot of school children disappointed down this direction. Um, and, and Brian, maybe you could tell us a little bit, give us a little bit of background to the project, um, the Upland Farm. Chagas did have an Upland Farm uh, in Westport at one stage where we were doing a lot of research there on extensive systems. Um, but maybe you could uh, just give us a little bit of background to the work that you're doing. Yeah, this is a, a, a thousand hectare uh, hill farm. Uh, it was acquired in uh, 1960s and it was always a, a great uh, resource for the college for education and for livestock technology. And then uh, really the last 15 years, it's been a, a big focus for environmental work and um, really moving into, into biodiversity in particular. And then more recently in the last couple of years, we've been we've been looking at absolutely everything um, that the Hill Farm does. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I'm looking forward to telling you all about it, Mark. I, sh I should correct myself. I think I said Westport there a minute ago it was Lean Ann is where the farm, the Chagas farm, you might you might have come across it in your, your travels. And Catherine, I know that there's a, a nice collaboration uh, there and, 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 and work working between Chagas and uh, Caffrey in this area. Yeah, well, I, I learn a lot from from Brian and Caffrey and uh, I'm involved in the Cumra Uplands communities, your EIP. Um, and that is an EIP that the Chagas Hill Sheep uh, Water for Discussion Group with Katrina Foley, the advisor, uh, put in for and got. And we we're very fortunate to have Owen Carton as the um, as the project manager. So last year, uh, the farmers and ourselves went to uh, to visit the upland because it's, it's so relevant. And, and honestly, I think the farmers were ha are looking at the, the Cumra Mountains in a different light because of what they, what they saw in Glenferry. So that's why I was very, I think it's of huge interest to all upland farmers mm. and advisors um, what's going on mm. in Glenferry. So really looking forward to Brian. It's so important, isn't it? To look over the fence and see what's happening in other, other countries. And I, I know it's something we all miss is uh, being able to, to do a little bit of uh, travel and just to, to share experiences um, with, with other, other colleagues and, and farmers in, in different countries. So uh, hopefully we get a chance to do that a little bit more this year. Um, but look, I, I think maybe we, we'll move straight to the presentation, Brian. Uh, you have a, a, a around a 30, 25 to 30 minute presentation for us. So we'll ask you to share your screen. And just while you're doing that, I might remind everybody that today's uh, um, webinar is being recorded uh, as a video and also as an audio. So you can, you can listen to it as a podcast on your uh, podcast platform or you can view it on the Chagas YouTube channel, as well as having a look at the presentation can be downloaded from the Chagas website. So Brian, we'll hand over to you and we'll chat to you after your presentation. Okay, are you seeing the full screen, Mark? Yes, that looks yep. perfect. Okay, great. Uh, uh, Happy New Year to everybody. Uh, I'm gonna talk about the Glenwary Hill Farm and uh, the map uh, on the right shows you where about it, it is. We're in south of County Antrim. Uh, at the bottom of the Antrim Plateau, really, um, on a basalt 
Um, and this is part of uh, an SPA, Special Protected Area for Hen Harrier and Merlin. Uh, so you should be seeing a map now, uh, a satellite image, which will give you an idea. Um, the yellow dotted line north of that, we're in peatland, and below that, we're in mineral soils. Uh, of course, the lines in reality is more wiggly than that, but that gives you a rough idea. The block on the right is the, the creve uh, that um, goes to a reservoir called Killy Lane Reservoir, which serves 60,000 people. Uh, that's down uh, to the south of, of the picture you see at the minute. We're also doing a lot of work on the point, and we'll mention the glen as well. Um, we rise from 300 feet above sea level down in the yards up to a thousand feet at the top. Fairly exposed hill, but but southerly facing. Um, big thing to notice really is is the lack of in by land. We have about 60 hectares that uh, can be cut for silage, so that grounds work very hard with uh, yews. Then two cuts of silage, then then sheep again. Um, okay, I'm just going to keep. Moving through, this is our, our vegetation classification, uh, and the purple and the pink is is blanket bog and degraded blanket bog. Uh, the yellow is marshy grassland, um, heavily dominated by rush. Uh, then down at the bottom, the the light greens, improved grassland, some semi-improved and and some unimproved. Um, other things to note are the big blocks of forestry, so three main blocks of, of forestry you can see there. And, and those are, are certainly uh, an issue for us. Um, the red dots on the map are where we've been doing vegetation monitoring since 2009. So AFPI has, has done that for us every three years. And really vegetation is very slow to change. Um, so it's, it's keeping uh, a monitoring system in place there to see what happens whenever we cut or flail or burn or graze. Um, uh, so that's providing uh, useful data. But I think the key thing is, is the mosaics involved. Uh, if you look at the right hand side of the Creve unit, uh, you can see that uh, it really is a mosaic. It's a big 160 hectares there uh, grazing one block. And that presents farmers as ever in agri-environment schemes with, with issues. Okay, the, the farm has uh, 100 suck cows. Uh, it's a three breed cross. So there, there's a batch of Angus cows uh, put to the shorthorn bull, shorthorn to limousin, limousin cows then to, to Angus. So it, it keeps rotating that way. Uh, excellent cows. Replacement, the heifers are taken down to uh, the lowland farm and brought back to, to calve at 24 months. Um, the cows are grazed on, on what we call the parks, and they're mostly semi-natural grassland. Some of them uh, rush infested, uh, some of them reasonable. Uh, there's 1,100 ewes, and we have a batch of pure blackface, then we have blackface cross swale, and then that cross is put to Texel. Uh, so we have uh, three sort of batches uh, of, of sheep. Um, the one of the main things we've done recently is in the last five or six years is the new sheep house, which can accommodate 750 ewes, and that has been fantastic educational resource uh, for student work. And as well as that, there's there's umpteen technologies in there that are available to the to the sheep farmer. It's actually improved the um, the data collection in sheep which is really tickled through into, into results. Um, and this last year, there were 1,640 lambs uh, out of 1,100 ewes to the tip. Um, so probably at the highest number ever. And, and that just keeps going up, I think, with, with the um, selection process, possibly getting to the stage where there's too many now. Okay, there's plenty of data on, on uh, sheep and cattle. I'm not going to go uh, down into this. Uh, the key thing is that there is 28 ton roughly of calf weaned. There is uh, uh, 40 to 50 ton of, of lambs weaned. Um, the performance is very good. Uh, we look at uh, efficiency. So efficiency in kilograms of, of weaned weight per kilograms of cow or yew. 
Uh, the sheep are doing tremendously well, moving from 0.64 in 2016 up to uh, 0.74 uh, in 2021. So we're looking to get that to 0.75 for the sheep. Cows, the target is to get to 0.5 uh, and we're moving there, but we've, we do have an issue with, with cow weight. Um, I guess from my perspective uh, from the biodiversity team, I'm looking at this and thinking, well, what, what is the output here? It, it's about 71 tonne of, uh, of livestock as an annual output. When I divide that over our farmed area, so uh, over our 960, we get about 75 to 80 kilos of output. When I compare that to a lowland situation where we are producing 1,000 kilos uh, on an intensive beef system, we stop and have a look at that. And certainly when we talk to students at the beginning of their course, and I ask them, well, uh, should this hill farm be getting the same level of BPS as a lowland farm? Uh, they uh, unanimously or nearly unanimously tell me no. Um, so we have to really tease out this. Um, now this 75 to 80 kilos per hectare output, when we actually break that down into our land types, that's actually between 10 and, and 500 kilos. We are, our in-by lands getting worked really hard. Our, our moorland out there might only have half a year on it for half a year, so it might maybe produce a quarter of a store lamb. Uh, so really its output is remarkably low. So Caffrey realized this uh, probably 15 years ago and said, what are we gonna do about this? What, what else can, does a hill farm produce? So that's where the move was into biodiversity. So uh, the hill went for a, uh, to create a, a GHRP, which is the Glenwary Hill Regeneration Partnership. And um, we brought in quite a lot of uh, different partners. So the Irish Grouse Conservation Trust and RSPB were the two uh, partners brought into this. Then um, advisory groups of NAIA, Raptor Study Group, um, AFBI, and uh, the Agri Environment Team within, within DERA as well. So that group sits uh, two, or two to three times a year and is, is the steering body for the, the hill farm strategy. Uh, then we have the local farmers who we engage with. They're very much a part of this and uh, we meet up with them uh, once a year and, and bring them on board as well. So this partnership, uh, I suppose the first key part of it is, is predator control. So if you look at the map on the bottom right, you can see that uh, we have an area there that is shaded in green, that's 3000 hectares. So the gamekeeper shoots over 3000 hectares. Uh, there's a thousand hectares there in the middle, which is the Caffrey farm where we uh, trap as well. So we're um, doing predator control on foxes, crows and rats. Um, the the foxes are shot by, by rifle with thermal imaging equipment um, and the numbers are fairly colossal. So from September this year, uh, within that area, there would have been over 100 foxes taken already. Um, we're looking at this bit as being a, a nature recovery area. So over the last uh, 15 years, this uh, we're trying to create create increase our wildlife in there and then that's going to spill over into the surrounding area so with a thousand hectares in the middle with two thousand hectares beside it uh, that's been uh, shot over and then we have an associated three thousand hectares which is in another rspb project which is also involves predator control so we we're looking at a six six and a half thousand hectare block where predator control is happening uh, a byproduct of that is our, our introduction to gamekeeping course. So we have BASC and Irish Grouse Conservation Trust taking this course for us. And that's great to bring on uh, other conservationists uh, in the, the north and, and quite a few from the south coming to it as well. Okay, how, how has this worked? So if we look at red grouse, so we started in 2007, uh, our summer count would have been 37 birds. 
Uh, and then by the time we get to 2020, we're at about 340 birds. Um, so th that's within the, the main thousand hectare block. Um, so we have uh, seen a, a big and steady increase in, in grouse numbers. We are probably around the plateau at this stage. Um, you can see a few dips and things there. There was a, a gamekeeper wasn't there for a few months in 2013, so a vast uh, dramatic impact. Uh, there was no uh, counts done in uh, spring of 2020. And then in 2021, actually, we had a big, uh, because of the drought, a lot of the grouse birds left, uh, so there was no count done there. But we fortunately have, they're all back for the winter, or, or uh, big numbers are back. Uh, the Irish Grouse Conservation Trust won the pretty gold medal for red grouse and other ground nesting at risk species back in 2019 for this project. Okay, we're looking at hair numbers on the site. Um, from 2009, we were slightly above the, the Irish average on the site. I remember from working on this site back in the 1980s, there was always, uh, a, you know, was always good for hares, but really the, the work that's gone on on the site um, has, has increased the hares up towards 39 to 40 uh, hairs per kilometer square. That's balanced down a bit now to about 33, 34. So we've probably got a stable population at this stage. The 2021 count, uh, the raw data is the same as, as 2017, 2018. So that, that will continue there. And so this is one of the strongest populations in Ireland for, for grouse and, and hare. Okay, we're also looking at uh, breeding waders on the site. Uh, so we started off in 2009 with one pair of uh, breeding, one pair of snipe on the uh, a particular breeding wader site uh, to the uh, west of the farm. And uh, that's in, in this graph in yellow. And you can see then by the time we get to 2018, we're up at 14 pairs. Um, the dark blue bar will give you the total number of snipe pairs uh, that's been counted, really running from, um, we started measuring in the rest of the farm as well from 2012. So from 2012 to 2021, uh, we've moved up from eight pairs up to uh, 37 pairs. So a nice steady trend. Uh, and there's, there's still room to go there. Uh, a few photographs of snipe up there. Um, just on a few restored areas we've done recently, you can see some camera trap photographs at the top. Uh, you, you, just unbelievable what goes on after dark. Uh, that's there's a lot of a lot of snipe activity there. Okay, we're also looking at uh, curlew and lapwing. So there would have been zero curlew and lapwing from 2009 when the project started. We got our first first pair of curlew then uh, in 2016. And since then, there's been two or three uh, um, chicks fledged um, each year. And then in 2021, we had a couple of pairs of lapwing arrived and with three chicks fledged. Um, so we've, we've got a steady increase there. We're hoping to get uh, more curly back. We had four pairs in and around the site this year, but we had only one, one pair that, that fledged young. Um, then, and the, the photograph on the left is a, a curly nest I nearly stood on this year. Um, the, okay, the next one is, is skylark and meadow pipit. So we are particularly interested in these birds because these are uh, prey of, of hen harrier and we're in the hen harrier SPA. So our, our work has shown a steady increase in, in these numbers as well. And um, you can see from 2011, when the first count was done of these, um, we're, we're moving from uh, 24 and, and 56 uh, up now to over 120 um, pipits and, um, and uh, 70 skylarks. Uh, photograph on the right, actually, I meant to put one in of a hen harrier, but that's a, a golden eagle chasing off a, a peregrine. Um, so there's plenty of activity uh, over the site uh, because of the amount of, of wildlife. Uh, it brings in a lot of predators, predatory birds, raptors. 
Okay, uh, breeding weirder site, a particular bit of, of mineral land uh, on the, uh, the west of the farm. Uh, we're focusing heavily on, on everything that we should be doing for breeding waders in the site. So uh, we're making a lot of scrapes. That's, that really helps. Uh, obviously, these birds, um, their chicks have to feed themselves from day one. So soft ground, access to plenty of grubs, water's edge. So uh, lots of little scrapes throughout the site. Um, we will go in and, and flail excess forage and, and rush uh, quite often in January, February to try and get the, the ground conditions as low as possible for the waders because um, really a bare, bare ground is what they're looking for with a bit, with a bit of cover. Uh, this year we've put 19 cows out. Uh, they were weaned early and they have been out um, and on the wader site from early November and hopefully will be there to the end of January. There's been standing in snow the last three days. They started off at over condition score four and are now between condition score two and a half to three. Fantastic for the cows uh, to get them a lot fitter uh, for calving. And uh, I expect to see no calving issues with that batch at all. Um, other things then we've been doing as we've been going along is uh, providing multiple water sites uh, around the farm. So in, in the peat ground, it's been uh, little, little Merlin dams where anywhere there's a flush and we know it will keep refilling. So uh, th there's one done in, in February and then you can see what it looks like in, in September. So it just fits into the, the landscape very well. And that's fantastic for breeding waders and for in damselflies and, and, and other insects. Okay, uh, then we moved away from biodiversity. We didn't move away, but we, we added to biodiversity as, as an output from the hill farm. We went uh, a couple of years ago, we started looking at, at water quality. So this is a, a large 57 hectare block of, of woodland uh, planted in 1982. Um, the GHRP had been looking to um, take this away for a number of years. Uh, and we finally got in and harvested in December 2019. We've been monitoring the quality of the water uh, from before that uh, at, the, at the base of the, the, the forest. Uh, I'm looking particularly at a DOC. So a dissolved organic carbon that turns up in the, in the, in the brown color that you see in, in peat water. Um, We've been looking at the level of DOC and how much it would cost uh, the reservoir to, to treat that. And basically we're getting a treatment cost of 90 pounds per hectare from that site. Now we're comparing that with um, a relatively intact moor uh, and uh, the treatment cost for that is about 18 pounds a hectare. So 72 pounds per hectare per annum difference uh, between these two sites. Uh, those in the photograph there, the washing machines, you see those are um, auto samplers that are taking uh, seven already samples out of the out of the stream there and out of the outflow from the, the forest. And that's what we're comparing. Uh, we're seeing quite a lot of changes through the season. Um, and we're, we're checking that with our, our rainfall stats. And, and that's where we, we can, uh, the Queen's students have been able to work out the, the 72 pounds per hectare difference. Now that's very relevant because remember, uh, our output of here is maybe a quarter of a store lamb or half a store lamb. So that 72 pounds a hectare is, is important. Next thing we're looking at is, is flood alleviation. We're looking at flow rate um, off these areas. Um, I think the easiest way to explain this is to look at a five millimeter rain event. Um, now we've, we're comparing a heavily modified site where the water table is low um, because of, of big drainage activity. So therefore it's got a high storage capacity and we're comparing that to a very minor modified Merland where the water table is, is very high. And we, so therefore it has a low storage capacity. So if you look at the, the table there, you can see that uh, hours to reach peak flow after a five mil uh, rain event is two hours in the deeply and intensively drained site. Then hours to return to base flow is 25 hours. So really all that rain that came down was away again within 25 hours. 
Uh, relatively intact bog, if we do the same comparison, we, it's taken us seven times longer to reach uh, peak flow, and it's taken uh, three days to return to base flow. So the advantage of having uh, where most of the rain occurs, um, of, of alleviating uh, the flow, um, delaying discharge is, is big. Uh, and that's something that isn't thought of that much. We're getting more and more extreme weather events. We have our, uh, a great weather station uh, on the hill farm, and that is, is actually demonstrating some real extreme events. If we can hold that back, it gives uh, farmland lower down a good chance to, to drain out before the, the deluge comes from, from the hill. Wildfire prevention is a big one. Uh, we have created a, a wildfire response plan and we hope to use that uh, template for, for other farmers. Um, so it's a three to four page template. Um, then we're looking at a prevention strategy. So we have a heather resource map um, designed and uh, that gives us the, the areas most at risk and where we've been cutting or burning or creating fire breaks. Um, and, and really it, it highlights the importance of grazing control um, and all the other activities we do, ultimately with re-wetting being uh, the ultimate in wildfire prevention. This is, a, as you know, this year has been uh, an incredible year. 18 million hectares uh, burnt in, in Russia, uh, over 7,000 fires in Portugal. Uh, uh, the Welsh are now starting to complain. So it is it's becoming a, a very big issue. And the reason it's a big issue is because of peak carbon storage. And we really need to get a bit of a handle on, on what we've got. Um, so those two guys in the picture, those are from Queen's uh, Archaeology, and they are taking samples and they're going to put it through their new carbon dating machine and give us a, a carbon um, impact, uh, carbon uh, se sequestration over the last 500 years. Uh, roughly speaking, we've got about 400 tonne of carbon per hectare in, in, a, in a meter depth of peat. Uh, that's the equivalent of 1,500 ton of CO2 equivalents. Um, so that gives us somewhere uh, in the region of one to two million ton of CO2 equivalents stored uh, on the Caffrey Hill farm. Now, the reason it's it's quite wide is the references are quite wide in themselves. So it'll be good to get some bulk de density measurements and, and get that more exact. But I want you to remember that one to two million ton of CO2 equivalent that as a uh, if you keep an eye on, on that number. So that brings us to our CAFRI carbon zero target. Um, we have a uh, livestock emissions, we would have thought was the big one uh, at 1500 ton of CO2 equivalent, but peatland emissions are 3000 ton. Now that's a, a very high figure. We get that from applying the, the IUCN UK peatland emissions factors and the UK peatland code protocol. Um, but when you compare it to one to two million ton of store, it's, it's a very small amount, but it, it's a major problem for us. So the first way we're going to uh, get past this is, is forest to bog. So we have to uh, remove a poorly growing forest, uh, which has an emissions factor 9.9 .9 ton of CO2 equivalent per hectare. And there's lots of reasons for for getting rid of the forest. So we started there December 19, you can see in the top right uh, logging going on. What we're left with on the top left is, is ground that has been plowed a meter deep. Uh, so there's minor drains three meters apart, uh, peat thrown up into a furrow, uh, up into a ridge, and with main drains then 50 meters apart and two meters deep. So a heavily drained site. Uh, we've been using a variety of techniques, stump flipping, ground smoothing, peat buns, peat dams, turf relocation, cell bonding, and drain blocking to uh, restore that. And you can see what it looks like there. October 21, that's recent work. January 21, that last year's work. Um, and to give you an idea, January 21, that's an area that's been finished. You can see uh, bare peat. You can see lots of turfs that have been relocated. So we're asking the guys to uh, collect uh, vegetation out of the furrow, set it to the side, do their work, and then replace that vegetation. You can see in the lighter map in the top right, 
you'll see the, the raised areas are the brash mats. So an awful lot of timber refuse left. Uh, and you can see the deep drains and you can see the minor drains running north to south as well. Um, so we had brash over 30 to 40% of the site. And this was timber brash, not just minor brash. Um, we had a very uh, tough year last year. Uh, it, it was very dry. I'd been hoping for plenty of rain in the summer. Uh, but even so, you can see, but relocating the, the turfs with, with a lot of wavy hair grass was spreading across the place, uh, a lot of sphagnum recovery. So uh, it's very good. Over the top right, uh, uh, sorry, bottom across to the right, you can see a, a dip well with simple dip wells sited around the site where we're monitoring water table. Uh, we also had a bit in lodgepole pine, which had been mow ploughed, and uh, those mow drains are still working 40 years on. So they're simpler to work. We just uh, trench across them to break the, the mow drains, and uh, dam them, uh, and create a little bond there. So we can do less intrusive in that one. Okay, our next bit is re-wetting open moor. So we have a standard emissions factor of, of 3.4. Uh, ton of CO2 per hectare per year being emitted if it's if it's drained uh, moorland. We have the Nature April 21 paper telling us that we a 10 centimeter reduction in the water table depth is equivalent to three ton of CO2 equivalent uh, reduction. So uh, we're looking to to achieve that uh, and to get towards neutral to get to peatland accumulating condition. A couple of different methods we're using. One, we're identifying peat pipes. Peat pipes uh, are underground natural drainage systems in, in moors. So we, we've broken one of these and uh, then taking, bringing the water back up and into a series of dams and allowing the water to then leave the site uh, via these dams. And so that was done in February 21. And you can see the series of, of terrace dams down, down this little valley, this sort of flush valley. We're bringing the water up to raise the water table, but we're also creating uh, permanent uh, pools of water for, for the birds. We're moving on to open moor. Uh, and uh, we again, we have this emissions factor reduction, 3.4 tonne of CO2 equivalent. We're trying to get the water table uh, uh, increased. So we're, we're getting closer to the surface. Uh, and certainly our, our first year's work has shown that between the control site and the demo site, yes, we're getting it over the 10 centimeters. Our summer activity, the water table tends to be between 10 and 20 centimeters from the surface. And the control site is down at about 50 centimeters. This is done uh, primarily with peat dams at a cost of four to five pounds a dam. Uh, so you can see that we have marked out the, the, the minor drains. This is a site we've been doing this December. Uh, we've been using handheld uh, trimble device to, to mark all the drains, mark all the peat blocks, because once it's done, it's very hard to go back and, and see. Uh, how effective it's been. We're using a range of stuff, mostly peat dams. We're trying plastic inserts, plastic pilings, wood. And then we're going to bring further researchers on to check these emissions by monitoring fluvial and gas lo losses. So Queen's, also University, CEH are, are involved there. So CEH are going to be putting up a, a flux tower next month uh, on the Creve Moor, which will give us the gas readings. And you, you are organizing a PhD. Uh, for further fluvial carbon works. Okay, uh, I'd be glad to know it's my last slide. It's a fast run through. So really to sum up our, our Caffrey Hill Farm outputs, we started off with livestock, we moved into biodiversity, that is progressing very well. And we're now identifying all these other features, water quality, flood alleviation, carbon storage, wildfire prevention, and carbon sequestration. So we see the hill farm as being uh, so much more than, than just livestock. Um, it has an awful lot to achieve and, uh, from my opinion, requires a lot more than, than, than BPS. Uh, you can see environmental measure, measurements that are, we're undertaking. We're trying to collect as much data as we can on the one site so it is as most 
useful to, to other people. Uh, we have various research partners, and we certainly welcome uh, any other research partners who want to join us as well. Uh, I'll stop there, Mark. That's great, Brian. Thanks very much for that. I uh, really enjoyed your presentation and uh, nice to see a case study, you know, how, how, how things are working on the ground. Um, and obviously, uh, you know, you're, you're, you're doing a lot of work there in, in I suppose, undoing some of the, the work that was done in the past. Um, we, we have had some questions coming in there just around the, the forestry side of things. And I know, look, um, people mightn't be aware that you know there was there was a lot of forestry planted during that uh, that eighties period that was probably just not appropriate on on those those types of peat soils. It has happened here in the west of Ireland as well. Um, has there been? Uh, did you have to seek any special dispensation to not have to replant that, or uh, is it is it the same as as down south here? That's just there isn't a, a planting requirement there on peat soils. Uh, we, we, absolutely. We, we go through our, our EIA as, assessment uh, process and certainly whenever the, it, the biodiversity objectives are stated and uh, it, it, it was fine. Yes, because of deep peat, we are no longer replanting uh, essentially on deep peat. Um, yeah. Uh, for, for a service, yes, if, if the first crop has been very successful, then uh, it is anticipated there will be it will be replanted. Uh, if it is not, then it is looked at. And if there is a request for an EIA, then it is it is granted. Yeah. In terms of the, the wildlife management side of it, then uh, there, there is the, um, you know, how, how do farmers benefit from that? Like down south, we would have a lot of commonages here uh, where, you know, there's a shared responsibility, but also shared ownership of, of the, the land. How do you see that working in in, the, in that scenario? I presume there's no commonage involved in this particular site. No, there's not in this site, uh, but we're working with all the, the neighbouring landowners. So um, quite frankly, we've had a, a 100% um, you know, acceptance of, of that and uh, willingness to participate. Um, the farmers are delighted to, to see uh, wildlife returning to their hills. Mm. Um, and I think that the key message uh, in this so far, Mark, has been that our livestock production is, is excellent and our biodiversity numbers have been just steadily rising uh, mm. with no detriment to the livestock. Yeah. At that's this stage. A, that's, a, that's a really positive story because, uh, you know, there is that narrative i think in some people's minds that it's either one or the others mm. you're saying it can be both um uh provided that the payments are correctly orientated i, I guess that's that's what you, you 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 covered off in your last slides there that you know that yeah. that uh, in fact there probably is uh, the value or that has been produced or the services that are being produced from this 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 land is is it needs to be valued um, just a question I had there, it, it, when you showed a slide uh, showing the, the various different water samples from uh, the forest and just wondering was there a, a noticeable difference from when the forest was felled after the, it, it's felling in, in the DOC levels or uh, was that observed? Uh, surprisingly not, Mark. Um, so that was... Uh, interesting um so we were taking grab samples from around the forest site we were uh, taking samples from before and after and and surprisingly not no um now a lot we did leave the forest the forest contractors left a lot of uh, drains blocked you know which uh, may have helped in that situation uh, i think if they'd all been opened up again yes it would have gone up mm -hmm. Uh, I see I, uh, we have some questions, uh, people uh, wondering, are you facilitating group visits <laughs> to the site? Uh, so you've obviously already stirred a lot of interest amongst advisors uh, down here, but uh, uh, COVID permitting, I imagine, are, uh, is that something that can be arranged? Or? I, I absolutely, it can, Mark. Yeah, look, we, we've had a quiet time. Uh, we've just been bringing policy people up over the last year, mostly. Uh, Catherine was lucky with her group. She just got in in a, in a narrow window there. And uh, yeah, there'll be an open day in early July this year. And, and certainly we do bring groups, yeah. Catherine, some, there's some uh, really excellent questions coming through and 
If you yeah. do have a question, you can use it. And if you're new to the signpost series, just use the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen there and uh, do send us your questions and we'll, we'll try and get through as many of them as possible. Uh, Catherine, over to you. Yeah, we have a few different themes. So let's start with the predators. Um, is the aim to remove foxes completely or to maintain them at a sustainable level, Brian? Uh, that's quite easy to answer. It would be impossible to remove them completely. They are uh, an amazing creature. Um, and look, we've been at this for absolutely years and the numbers keep on coming. And I, I would say probably you're at a higher level this year. They must th than than ever. And are there any other predators? Uh, Mink was mentioned there. Is it controlled or, or how if... So any other predators other than foxes? Uh, yeah, certainly uh, crows with, with larsen traps, uh, rats. Uh, we do have a problem with, with ravens. Um, obviously they're protected. Uh, over the hill behind us, badgers are, are an issue on uh, raiding ground nesting birds uh, sites. So RSPB has had great success putting electric fences around uh, uh, curlew nests this year. So in 2020, there would have been zero fledged on other sites in Glenwarney. And in 2021, I think there was 22 curly fledged, and that was down to the electric fences around the curly nests. Interesting. Um, on to the cattle. Uh, again, you probably mentioned there the breed of cattle, and also a question on: Do you expect a production or live weight gain loss? You know, a live weight loss from uh, on the rewetted bog. <laughs> Yes. Uh, now, it, it is interesting. The re-wetted bog at uh, one of our sites goes particularly dry in the summer and is, is very wet in the winter. So we've now, we're have now we now turning it to wet all the way through. But strangely enough, in the summer, in the summer, it's, it's, it's fine. Um, so probably in the first bit we've done in an area called the point, there won't be any uh, reduction. Uh, in some better moors, there is bound to be some reduction. Um, but the way the sheep numbers have gone and the, the breeding the, are so good, we haven't had enough yews with singles to put out to some of those rougher areas. Mm. There's been that many yews with twins. Um, and the breed of cattle, Brian? Breed of cattle, yeah. Uh, Angus, uh, Shorthorn, Limousin, they're, they're great cows. Um, we do have a problem with them having increased in in weight recently, and that is down to you know the individual bull selection. So I think with one particular Angus, it was actually too too framey. Um, so yeah, there's potential for for moving a different breed in there in the future, but uh, those cows are you know they're holding condition well. Yeah. Okay. Um... Just uh, will replanting on peatlands increase carbon emissions? Um, well, the basic problem is if you're growing forestry, you need to be uh, hitting yield class eight to ten before you're sequestering more than you're emitting. So, if you on deep peat, if it's a great crop of trees, then it works. Uh, if it's an average or poor crop, then we're losing more carbon than we're sequestering. Okay. And then just the other biodiversity angle as well, I suppose, yeah. on, the, on that. Um, but how is vegetation monitoring carried out? Uh, that's done in two meter uh, square grids. Um, so those are, you know, GPS marked and they return to those every, every three years and assess the percentage of, of um, vegetation there. Vegetation assessment is interesting. You know, it, it's not up to 100%. It's, it's higher because it's three-dimensional. It goes up to 130, 140%. We're looking for 50 to 60% uh, sphagnum moss to be a uh, peat accumulating condition, as well as having heathers and grasses and sedges growing above that. Brilliant. Mark, I have two more quick ones before I come back to you. Um, any invasive alien species? Uh, we do have problems with uh, with Sitka spruce uh, spreading throughout the site from from our forestry. So we are working on a just a very long term process of cutting those out. As long as we cut down below the lowest branch, uh, we can we a cut will will kill them. Um, uh, that is probably the only invasives we have. Yeah. 
And a uh, final one for me for this moment, Mark, are cultural services um, being uh, considered? Yeah, we, we've, we've run, up until COVID, we were a very popular spot for, for Duke of Edinburgh. Um, uh, students who would have come up and, and practiced their, their, their trails were part of the Antrim Hills Way, which is unfortunately temporarily closed. So we see access as an important thing, because obviously during lockdown, we've seen so many people requiring to access the, the, the outdoors. So how we can facilitate that, yeah, we'll continue to look at that. And um, yeah. There was, there was a question relating to that actually around any health and safety concerns there with, with those various dams and, and uh, ponds that you've created. Is that a concern for you with, with, with walkers tra traversing the, the land? Absolutely, it is. Um, so we have signs up in the in the forest to to bog restored areas. Those are the the particularly soft ones. The other ponds and dams. Uh, you have to remember we're trying to minimise the the depths of those. Mm. So um, the the idea is not to create uh, very. Now, obviously, we could still lose lambs and the odd yo and one, but I'm I'm trying to maintain the depths so that w w it's certainly safe for for stock people. I, I I think if we have the right breed of sheep, uh, we won't. Well, we'll always lose some sheep, but we we won't lose. That won't be a big issue. Uh, we certainly haven't lost any yet. Maybe just talk about the carbon emissions side of, of things. You mentioned uh, about the, the actual carbon stored there within the, the peatland. Uh, do you have any figures on the emissions rates from, from the peatlands? That, uh, I, know, I think you did mention emissions rates for the moorlands. Um, now, maybe I missed it. Uh, yep. Just I know there's a lot of interest, obviously, in that whole area at the moment. And uh, uh, one of the measures within the, the marginal abasement cost curve within uh, Ireland is that re-wetting of peatlands as, as a yep. means of, of improving the, the carbon sequestration potential. Yeah, look, we're using standard uh, IUCN uh, UK emissions factors. Um, so that's a very good start, but we're, we're going to go uh, more local than that because we have to demonstrate to farmers that, that those are correct. Um, mm -hmm. Now, one of my uh, colleagues has a great saying, there's the, the Eskimos have 50 words for snow. Mm -hmm. And yet we, we talk about peat bogs. You know, and it, it, the reality is they are so different. Uh, some have got intensively drained, some are, are naturally dry. Um, you know, so what is the difference? And we can't lump them into all into one emission factor. But the factors we are using is 2.08 and 3.4. So that's for undrained and drained grassland and and heather moorland dominated. Um, so those uh, figures. Then when we get to we've 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 won block of 10 hectares which is fertilized and is deep peat and there we're looking at an emission factor of uh, maybe 15 to 20 ton of co2 uh, equivalent per hectare per year um, so we we are doing research work to to bring those down to more local figures and to um uh to move it around and see how it varies between slope and and site yeah, you know it's a, it's a it's a tricky one, all right. Given the the the, the heterogeneity there of, of of the site or most uh, bog sites, peatland sites. Um, uh, question there in relation to uh, well, just just a, a lot of comments coming through, Brian. Uh, one comment coming through: the best webinar so far in the series. So uh, you can you can uh, take a take that as a serious compliment. Um, the the uh, there was some questions there in relation to uh, the drainage side of things. Um, where is the, the one I was looking for? Yeah, there was just a, somebody uh, there pleased to, to see the old Billy Burke peat mold plow drain still working. <laughs> <laughs> um, I suspect somebody was involved in the actual rollout of that in, 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 uh, in ordinary or conventional lowlands. Um, uh, has uh, the re-wetting strategy affected the future possible stocking rates on the area is a question that has just come in there. Uh, look, definitely it has. Um, we, are, we are being greedy. We are trying to do everything. At some point, we will 
get to a stage where there will be an impact. Uh, there isn't yet. Um, I trust my colleagues on the farm to um, to think of every which way they can to to maintain stock numbers. But ultimately, I would expect you know us to drop a couple of hundred uh, to three hundred sheep. Um, strangely enough, cattle have a are much better from the vegetative point of view on, on the natural grasslands. So I, I would not be disappointed if we had more cows, maybe maybe more smaller cows. Um, and I think we'll look at some mob stocking this year of uh, on, on a particular bit to see if we can take reduce um, sheep grazing and just mob stock uh, two or three times a year with cattle and see if we can get an increase in, in scabious, for instance, as a, and uh, uh, in butterfly figures. Um, that would be interesting as a, as, a, as, as a demo compared to our normal. Just, just looking at the... I suppose taking a broader view of the economics of this, um, uh, I know that there's a, there's a lot of still a lot of hedge scratching going on around how we put a value on ecosystem services, and uh, it's a point that um, um, Donald Sheehan, uh, who is involved in the the Bride EIP project, makes uh, on every opportunity at every opportunity he has to to say, okay, how can we better. Uh, reward the farmer for these types of services um, from maybe beyond even uh, the, the 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 cap payment system um, or uh, the, you know how the marketplace is 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 the place that he would like to see some reward coming through from as well. Has there been any thinking around that being done uh, in relation to this project? Uh, yeah, uh, policy are, are are working on on the next uh, Northern Ireland strategy for 2024. Um, really, it's it's looking at a, a basic payment and looking at agri environment. So really, through the agri environment route. Uh, personally, I see this as as looking at what what conditions should uh, Merlin be to achieve the most uh, ecosystem services and. Mm -hmm. Uh, unusually um, re-wetting, having no active drains or few active drains uh, ticks all your boxes in carbon storage, carbon sequestration, wildfire prevention, uh, biodiversity, water quality. It ticks them all apart from, uh, apart from uh, livestock. Um, now, so certainly, uh, yeah, it, it would be great to see what the, the target, you know, what, what the advice is um, it, it's vegetation control. It, it's 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 having no active drains on your site. That's what you should be actually being paid for. Mm. Catherine, yeah, back to you. Yeah, just a couple of ones back on the on the cattle. Are you thinking of any of the the smaller breeds, the Dexter, the Irish Moel, or that? And I know a question came in about the collars, and I know you're using them, but you might just want to mention that that you're going looking at more things with the collars in the future. Yeah. Uh, well, look, we, we had, uh, yes, there's always interest in, in other breeds, absolutely. Um, we were going to change one of the breeds this year, but we're involved in other uh, livestock uh, exercises, a, a good myostatin project with, with the limousine. So, so we held on to that. Um, we do need to get our cow size down. We can get obsessed with breed. And uh, it's really, well, the, the usual thing we know that variation within breed is, is as much between breeds. And it, that's, that's an important thing to remember. Those cows um, are, are, are the only, they're fantastic cows uh, we've got at present. It's just getting size and, and trying, can we reduce size within breed or do we need to jump out um, that, that's that's the key question, but certainly when they're reared on the hill, they're perfectly capable of tackling forage. We have them 19 cows out with collars at the minute, and uh, we're we've just been monitoring GPS and uh, cow activity per per day, and uh, we're going to put on uh, the electric fencing system in the next week or so, so we can close them up and and graze out particular areas in the waiter site. Uh, we'll also look at sheep collars doing this on our habitat mosaic uh, this summer. Um, the, the, the activity rate is, is fantastic and to see the difference between Angus, Shorthorn and Limousin uh, and to see which animal is moving 
more in a day in a greater search for nitrogen and phosphorus in, in, in forage. Uh, in theory, the animal that moves the least is the one that is the most useful to you from the biodiversity point of view of just harvesting everything uh, in sight. Um, also interesting to see what the cows do at three and four in the morning. They are always up out for a graze. And just one final one from me, Mark, there, well, about the, the, the suckler herd, are they fed in, indoors during the winter? And maybe a related one then, is the lowland, um, you know, being pushed harder with maybe, and is there any issues with keeping the, the lowland sustainable in, in that kind of a, you know, when you're trying to juggle the two upland and lowland? Uh, okay, so yeah, cows are normally in from uh, mid-November uh, housed, uh, and uh, so this year we, we, we've kept cows out. In the past, I remember the 1980s, we used to always have 30 or 40 cows uh, outwintered, and I'm sort of head, trying to head back to that. Um, as a, are we pushing the lowland hard? Yeah, yeah, we're, we're, we're very intensive on our lowland and uh, we are looking at biodiversity in, in the margins around there. We're looking at water quality in the lowland as well. Um, I, we, that's the way we farm. We farm the lowland hard. The way we're looking at this at the minute is, is mineral soils should be farmed intensively uh, and peatland we should be easing way, way back. Um. A question, uh, Catherine, for you, I suppose, are there any similar projects happening uh, like this in Ireland? Um, I know there, there are, you, you, you know them better than yeah, I would. Yeah, well, I mean, there's a huge amount, and I think what we need to do is pull all together and, and uh, you know, we have the Harry or the Power Muscle, and we have the five Upland EIPs, and we're going to hear from, from um, Declan Byrne next week about Seuss. Uh, so, and I would say they're all working on slightly different angles, so, you know, we need, I suppose, there's a job of work there for us to do, Mark, to try and, and pull out the good work that is being done, which I suppose is, is where I see my role. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, no, it's, 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 there's a, a huge amount of interest in this particular area. And obviously a lot of land in, in, on this island is, is uh, upland and uh, it needs that, that uh, support network uh, for people to, to, to do the right thing, I suppose. Um, one thing you mentioned there, Brian, was these uh, trail cams, the, the photographs that you can take at night time. Uh, I, I think they're absolutely fantastic. I, I have one here and it's just amazing what uh, mm -hmm. you spot at night time and they can be motion activated. And uh, it's, it's something I'd advise everyone if, <laughs> if you have the, the means to, to, to invest in. It's just incredible how the, the place comes to yeah. life at night time. Um, well, we're just up on time, uh, Brian, uh, but just I want to say thank you sincerely for, for joining us uh, today. I, I see a lot of your colleagues are, are online as well there, so it's nice uh, to have that, that uh, linkage uh, with, with our colleagues in, in CAFRI. And um, thank you, Catherine, for helping with questions today. And also um, our series producer, Andy Boland, uh, and also Yvonne Maher for helping out with our technical uh, side of things today. Um, and just to remind you, if you do have topics that you'd like to see covered on the, the Signpost webinar, do get in touch with us through connected at chagas.ie, or you can send us um, a message through the, uh, the message system here. Uh, we're always keen to get feedback from, from you. And also, if you have a time to finish and uh, fill out any of those surveys, and a reminder that today's webinar is recorded and is available on the Chagas YouTube channel, as well as the uh, Signpost podcast uh, platform. So we'll leave it at that. Catherine, are you happy enough? Have you any yeah. other comments you'd like to make? No, just to remind this audience, if they found today interesting, it'll be very interesting with uh, the Seuss project and Declan Byrne next week. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Do tune in. A uh, really exciting project uh, that uh, Declan is involved in there. And uh, he, he, I know he has a really strong story to tell. And again, he's, he's well used to having visitors down uh, there in, the, in Wicklow as well. So look, we will leave it at that and look forward to seeing you all again next week at half past nine. Brian, thanks again. And uh, Catherine and Happy New Year to everybody. And uh, we look forward to you joining us for the rest of uh, the, the year. Okay, thanks, thanks very much. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.